Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Okay, so welcome to the final um, C Spotlight Talk. And I hope all of you have had a wonderful time going around C Focus, which is an excellent, excellent, I shouldn't say fair, I would actually, for me, just really experiencing it as an exhibition. Um, and that also brings us very nicely uh, oh boy, um, to the topic of the day. We're going to probably have a few more people coming in, so that's fine, that's how it rolls. And so today's panel uh, is called Not Just the Show, Exhibition Making in Southeast Asia. And I like to say it's not actually like a panel session that sounds very formal and very proper because I have with uh, me three absolutely wonderful and I like to think slightly improper but very experienced <laughs> um, panelists and I'm also going to say that because it is the last talk of you know um, the fair that we're going to have as much fun as possible uh, and it were not for the fact that it's actually being recorded I'm sure we'll say some incriminating and <laughs> slightly naughty things but it's actually very much part of the process of what we do um, I mean as as curators, producers, as we go, exhibition makers. Um, a lot, I think I say, what's wonderful is that people come in and they'll see the show, but um, perhaps the blood, sweat, tears, and occasionally nearly dead bodies that um, happen in the process of making an exhibition um, is part of what I think is both the love the passion, but also sometimes the pains of putting up a show. And I think that's something that we're going to be talking about today and hearing quite different perspectives as well. I think some of you might actually want to know exactly what is exhibition making? I mean, it's this term that's used a lot now. Um, I mean, for some of us, it's like, you might be a curator, but are you actually an exhibition maker? Um, are you a producer? Are you a creative maker? So these are terms that sometimes intersect, but they also have different inflections. But I think really key here is then, not just what exhibition making is, but sometimes then, what is the thinking process that goes behind it? So it's not just the what is a show, and our panelists today will also take us through the very different scenarios and circumstances by which an exhibition is staged because it's not always in a white queue. But also I think the, so it's not just the what, but the whys of it, you know, like what is the intention behind an exhibition? Why might we be doing something a certain way? But also I think what's not asked a lot, but it's very worth to think about. It's sometimes the ethics of putting an exhibition together. And, and ethics is a very big, large and fraught um, area, but hopefully we'll be able to touch upon some of these areas that, you know, when we navigate these tricky areas. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers to take us through. Uh, first we have is Chomwan Wirawarawit, who is a creative director producer and the curator of the Bangkok Art Binale. Uh, and then after that, we'll have John Tung, who is an independent curator and exhibition maker. And then Michelle Ho, who is director of ADM. So perhaps, Chom, if you'd like to start. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much, Joyce, for the awesome introduction. Thanks, C Focus, for having me. Um, I think the title of this show kind of I, I flew in from Chiang Rai last night, right? Because I really wanted to be here with John and Michelle and Joyce to actually talk about exhibition making or not. And also how it situates itself and how it, ex how it works here in Southeast Asia. I mean, for me, I work in Thailand, I live in Thailand, but that's not always where the exhibition happens. That's not always the stage, because what you have in the art world, it's one world interconnected with so many. And actually, it's, it's this sort of constantly moving global dialogue. So I'm just going to go through my slides a little bit, because I think that sounds a little bit abstract. But maybe this will put sort of some rationale or some kind of something concrete to it. 
I am not a, a curator per se. I, I kind of actually, I'm, I'm a lawyer. So I come from a legal background. I specialize in intellectual property. Uh, a little over a decade ago, with some friends, we felt that it was really important to actually propose that Thailand isn't just a place to hang out, have a cocktail, and sit on the beach. But actually, I mean, obviously it is, but, <laughs> but there's much more. And how can we present it in this way? And how do we do so when there aren't the cultural institutions to be able to support bringing people to Thailand or you know, to visit and having more than just cocktails on the beach, right? So I think this is something that, that's worth mentioning that's very different between Thailand and I think this is where Singapore is a bit of an anomaly. I mean, Singapore has public funding, public institutions and a program that, that is a few decades old, right? In Thailand, we don't. So anything that you see apart from the Thailand Biennale that's happening right now uh, is actually from the private sector. So in Thailand, it is blood, sweat, and tears because there isn't really a plan. And the fact that we're all kind of still in it and our art scene is extremely dynamic, growing, and actually very international, um, is I think because of the care and the love and the nurturing that exists in the community. So 12 years ago, I co-founded a film festival called Film on the Rocks, Yao Noi. It was structured as a film festival because we felt that that, that format would enable us to bring people together to, to do things, to make things, and we did this on an island. And it was co-curated by Apishat Pongwira Setakun and Tilda Swinton. And the whole premise of it was, you, you know, the question was, what ignited cinema for you? And cinema, and, and it's funny because over the last 12 years, I've been working a lot with, with, with cinema, with artists moving image, and actually exploring this idea of expanded cinema. And get back to that. But this was a floating cinema that we built for our small film festival. It was really small, it was independently funded, and it was extremely painful. Everything about it was painful, because it's so physical. So if you can imagine, like, what I do, because we build the ecosystem as we go, you know, I'm not just, in this project, I wasn't a curator, but I was a producer. I was like the line producer. I booked the flights, I booked the restaurants. You know, you kind of end up doing everything. But I think what that is kind of, the beauty, I mean, the difficulty is that it's, it's just hard, it's grueling, but the beauty is that it's collaborative and extremely convergent. So the conversations exist and they're real. And this was a floating cinema, which I think sort of, it's like a little bit pre-Instagram, but it kind of went viral at one point. But it was designed by the German architect Ole Scheren, who I think has built some buildings here, like Duo or a few things. But anyway, so Ole designed this, but it was actually a group of fishermen that built it for us. And what we showed there that night were films from various archives, like, Al uh, well, actually, Apishat Pong made a film called Titanic, but it was like found footage of the Titanic. I, I don't, I, you know, it's fun. It's like these choices that you have, right? When you're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the ocean, what do you show? And I think this is something that I, I can't wait to hear John and Michelle talk about their process because it's something that I'm really thinking about a lot. Like when we're putting together a show, who is it for and what is it for? I think for Film on the Rocks, it was really clear for us that we wanted people to come together to make things, to share and to make things. So we showed Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan, and this was 12 years ago. And since these, since 12 years, everyone who was there on that island together, I've worked with in some way, shape, or form. Because it wasn't just filmmakers, there were artists, designers, chefs. And I think what it started for me was kind of a little bit of a, a universe of, of really like, of relationships. And can we go to the next slide? So, um, on that, you know, two years ago when uh, Apinan Posianon, the artistic director of the Bangkok Art Biennale, invited me to be on the curatorial team of the Bangkok Art Biennale. I think it was the first time that what I do was put in a sort of institutional setting because everything that I have done prior was kind of projects that I'd started myself or in collaboration with someone else. 
it, it, it's sort of a desire to, to make and to share, you know? And I think with a Biennale, certainly for Bangkok, the public matters, the various publics. I think it was very clear that, you know, during COVID, they managed to stage one Biennale, present one Biennale, and it wasn't just for the art world and visitors. It was for us. It was for Bangkok. And I think that idea was something that really kind of flowed through to the one that we worked on together. This was a boat by the artist Tom Sachs. Tom came to the film festival 12 years ago and basically said to me as he was leaving on the long tail boat to go to the airport, he said, we're gonna build a boat together. And I said, really? Okay. And then when this invitation came up, he said to me, let's build a boat. And I said, how is a boat part of the show? And he's like, it's a sculpture. I mean, but it's more than a sculpture. It's an immersive environment. So again, you know, when a show or an exhibition isn't just something inanimate, but, an, like, but alive because you're there together, but also moving. So our boat was built, had, has had two lives. The first life was with fishermen in the south of Thailand as a fishing boat. We took over the boat and over the course of five months, we, we, we basically remodeled it into what Tom calls a vessel for space travel. I mean, this, if you think about it, and what was so interesting in this process was, Tom says, the ocean is like the sea, but when you speak to fishermen, they're like, oh, the ocean is like, oh, sorry, it's ocean is like the sea. Ocean is like space, like, and it's boundless. It's immediately, it was like this immediate, of course, absolutely. It was not abstract or foreign to them, and that we would put, that a boat should become a spaceship, like that, that, that idea was something that they all kind of adopted. And so the boat was part of the Biennale. It was on the river for seven days as a working boat. We had to get a license. We had to do all of that stuff. And then it eventually went and, and, and was on the lawn of the Museum Siam for four months. Now, what I didn't realize was that boats out of water are, are dead. You know, no one, no one really tells you this. So as an exhibition maker or as a curator or someone who's like, let's build a boat, I really want to do this. This project is amazing because it explores so many themes that we were talking about and in a way the boat becomes a vehicle for that exploration. No one tells you that if you put a boat underneath a tree, um, the leaves fall into your boat, dry up and clog up like the whole internal system. That's what happened. You know, it, no one tells you that, well, you know, if it's there out there long enough, there's termites. So it, it's this interesting thing when you're ultimately working with nature. So my two big projects, right, that kind of involve, so, you know, that was Apishat Pong, I work with Rick Hitt a lot with the land, and then Tom, they're really kind of placed back on the land. And it's this idea, and I haven't thought about it so much yet, but I think after I've been working quite a bit in Chiang Rai for a, with a collateral project I have to the, with the Biennale, nature, the force of nature, communities that kind of adopt you and host you as you go along, them becoming almost like your family and your, collab, your collaborators, then your family. How does that work? How do we evolve that conversation? And I think, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of kind of care. We were talking about it earlier, just this, this nurturing. So the boat currently is still back at the boatyard waiting for its next life. But what it inspired, you know, I know for, for Tom was, was, was the making. So what's so wonderful about Thailand is we still really, like, we make things. So the artisanal, the contemporary, there's, it's very blurred and it's very fluid. And I think this is something which, which I, I, I've started thinking about more as I go more into the realm of what is probably my panelists here have much more experience in, which is exhibition making and presenting shows not, not, on, not, not on the ocean, you know? So um, I think I think it's something which, um, 
Yeah, it's a little bit different, which if we can go to the next slide. So last year I worked after the Biennale, there was another artist in the Bangkok Art Biennale, Udom Sakrasanamit, who had a wonderful immersive environment in the Bangkok Art and Culture Center where there were ping, ping pong tables, there were like eggshells, you could paint them, you could really immerse yourself, but this is in a white cube. So Udom Sak asked me last January, he said, would you curate my show for me at 100 Tonson Foundation? I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, I would like to have a performance, I would like to have cooking, I would ha like to have workshops with children, I would like to have, I would like to work with Steinway. So it just went on, I said, you know, I don't think we're talking about a painting show, I think we're talking about a festival. And he's like, exactly, exactly, I want a festival. <laughs> and I was like, okay, and you see, you guys are laughing because you are, you are experienced exhibition makers. So when Udomsak and I come along and we're like, okay, six months, great. Udomsak's like, can we change the show every month? And the foundation director looked at him and was like, and looked at me, and I said, yeah, let's do it. Okay, maybe let's do three, every, three, every, every two months. She still looked at me horrified. Just, she's like, how are we gonna do that? And I said, well, money is not the issue. We have the budget. She said, no, but how? I said, we just do it. So you see, that's the difference. I think when you're working with the forces of nature and everything is like, I am very blessed to work with collaborators who see what, what I see in my mind to be small projects, probably a small projects too, but we'll put the blood, sweat, and tears in it. So that's what we did. And I think it was probably the most vibrant, active show that 100 Tonson has seen because we changed the install every two months. And, you know, the starting point was this silver foil. So Nomsak insisted that we turn the white cube into a silver box or a reference to, you know, Andy Warhol's factory because this is a factory of making. And I think the, the whole point was, and you'll see his works at the, at the front beautiful presentation of his very new paintings. But you know, the, what we did was we split the show up into three parts. It started with speed. Speed because this is an artist who has a brilliant mind and the technique to go with it. And he just kept making stuff. So actually my job as a curator was to edit. It, it was, you know, if it was up, for, up to a domsak, there wouldn't be any space left on the ground for you to walk on. It would just be covered with work. So it was this kind of dialogue, it was this speed that kind of led us to the next part and the next part we called arrival. I don't have the picture here, but arrival is this sense of speed eventually, like velocity gets to a point where you, you have to stop, you're exhausted. And when you arrive, we wanted to, I think, I imagine that you always wanna arrive not in an empty room, but in a room with your friends and your family. and. The second part was exactly kind of that. We started off with 12 artists that he curated. 12, 12 became 35, you know? So I think on the day of the install, there were still works being sent. And then at some point throughout the one month, the two months we had had it up, artists would just keep bringing us work. So it was just, it's just this constant movement. Again, for everyone involved, I know I was speaking to the art installers, they were like, this is the most fun we've had in ages. I was like, wow, guys, really? <laughs> I was like, you must really love what you do. And they said, well, yeah, it's really cool to be able to do this and have like our own input and to be able to see it keep moving, like the white cube keeps evolving. And then we get to the last part, which was called Strike, and we open the show with like, ping pong tournaments and screen printing and ended the show with, with a piano recital in collaboration with Steinway. So, and he, Steinway invited him to paint a piano, right? So, and then it, it, was, it, was, it was really beautiful. And um, the piano is now at Gaysorn. So I think a big part of what I do in the exhibition or not exhibition making process is I collaborate a lot. And that collaborative process is so fulfilling, but it's hard, you know, because you kind of, you sometimes make these assumptions, but every circumstance is just a little bit different. And um, wait, if I may mention, and again, I would love to hear, 
like your experience with this because what I came to understand, especially working with the Biennale, working on this show, is that it's really the art workers that make everything happen. You know, and, and like the, the kind of, the really, they're also kind of invisible. You know, so I think this sort of ecology of care and, and camaraderie that happens, I feel like in Thailand, I think it's something that we could, we could develop more because we don't have the public institutions to keep the work going, but that I think will change. But yeah, so that's kind of. Hey, thank you, Chom. Um, I mean, you said many things, which I think really opens up so many things for us to think about, which I'm sure John and Michelle pick up upon, but just some things I wanted to just think about. I mean, the title of this session is Exhibition Making, right? And there you go, if you think about the making about it, what you spoke about, what this is actually, it makes no sense at all. I mean, you think about, in some ways, the pace of things. Um, it's nonstop. Um, to some degree, there's always chaos. You don't really know where it's going on. Like artists, makers come with these amazing ideas. But if you thought about it as a rational, in a logical way, but it makes no sense whatsoever and we should never, ever, ever do it. But yeah, we do. <laughs> I mean, we make, I mean, we make um, the exhibition happen, you know, whatever the circumstances might be. And I think that's where, perhaps against some degree of common sense, that's where a lot of the energy of art and the creative process that happens off. So in a way, the exhibition might be the outcome, it's the object. But I think for all of this, it's actually the making of it, which is actually the energy. And John, um, I'm sure you're able to elaborate on that as well. And a number of your, and I've seen them, <laughs> projects that defy logic. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Joyce. I think I, I, it was quite a conscious decision to put the term exhibition maker, you know, next to, after independent curator, uh, in my job title. Um, even though I don't think this notion of exhibition making is fully clarified yet, uh, it's, a, I would say, a layman's way of introducing what a curator does. Because half the time when I introduce myself as a curator, they ask me, oh, so what exactly do you do? And I say, I make exhibitions. Um, and but to me, this picture sums up what exhibition making is about. So over the course of the next three slides, I would like to kind of make some clarifications as to what I personally regard falling within the realm of exhibition making and what falls into the broader scope of curatorial work, which is actually a lot of what Chom Wan um, elaborated on earlier. It's all of those collaborations, working with people, being super deeply involved with the process. Um, I think that... that you know, with this particular image here, I was installing um, a work titled Monument by Singaporean artist Kumari Nahapan at the private museum. And for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to, to visit the show, this took place sometime last year. It was the first exhibition in the private museum's new building, which means that no one had a chance to kind of test the waters, see what the building was capable of. And then with this particular exhibition, I was looking to res resurrect 30-year-old installations and put them in a 200-year-old building. And um, what Joy said about chaos is entirely spot on because every day, you know, I think a lot of exhibition making and curatorial work is about, you know, walking right into the eye of a storm and, you know, hoping that you have enough of um, the knowledge, equipment, logistical know-how and just sheer grit and de determination to get there. Um, I think exhibition making is something that I also employ to define my curatorial practice a bit because I do possess quite a significant bit of like technical know-how in terms of building things. And that's why over the past almost, I don't know, 10 years or something now, you know, one of the mainstays in my curatorial practice has been working with artists to realize new commissions. Uh, either new commissions or site-specific adaptations, and there have been in excess of 50 over the past 10 years. And to make an exhibition means that you necessarily have to do it with your hands. Um, that is 
a big part of the invisible labor which Chom Wan talks about because people come into an exhibition you know, without really thinking about why things are where they are or how do they get hung the way they get hung. And I think a big part of what I try to do is to actually make people stop and wonder for a moment how did this thing get up there or how did something get into a particular room so like a ship in a bottle putting really large artworks in really small spaces that don't look like they've been cut up at all I like to do this kind of um, rather challenging tasks within the scope of exhibition making itself so all in all um, <clears throat> exhibition making for me you know, fits into this broader scope of what I call curating and curating really boils down to care. You know, it comes from the Latin root word curare. And in some ways, every work that I work on with an artist, together with an artist, um, I do see that work as an infant kind of like being brought up. And so um, maybe we can go to the next picture. I want to delve into a little bit about <laughs> care. And actually, it's very lovely because we have the two lovely ladies who are in the photograph actually in the room with us, uh, Issy and Jackie. And um, Issy is part of an exhibition that's ongoing right now at Seligi Art Center titled Turning Points, which is an exhibition of artworks by artists with disabilities. Um, Issy was actually mentored by uh, Robert Chow uh, over the last five months for the development of a new body of work, development of her techniques. But when it came to the realization of the exhibition part, that's where I started to get more involved in the process and get to know Issy's practice a lot better. So exercises like such as these, you know, to go with the artist to um, the printing shop, you know, to do the rounds of test prints to ensure that the works are of the right quality, to offer an additional eye to look at things is also, I think, a really big part of the behind the scenes process, you know, that fits into a larger realm of curatorial work, but not necessarily exhibition making per se. And if this is behind the scenes, bef the, the before, then there's also the necessarily what comes after. And I think it's amazing how for all the photos I've chosen today, the people have somehow showed up in the room. You can go to the next photo. The next photo, of course, is you know, um, doing artist talks, you know, like you know, panel discussions. It's what a lot of people look forward to um, as part of an exhibition's programming. And I think these ancillary programs form a very, very, very big part of the exhibition because it serves to um, contextualize a lot of um, the artist's intents, their ideas, but also serves a very, very important part of um, having an additional layer of historicization at the same time. Um, you know, an exhibition doesn't last as long as the texts and the words that come out of it. And it's really through a lot of these artists' talks that we are able to you know, clarify the artist's intentions. Uh, with this particular talk, it was not necessarily tagged to a specific exhibition itself, but rather uh, with Dr. Susie Lingam, who has snuck in at the back there, uh, and Martin Constable, both very eminent uh, educators. Um, it was actually about the state of, well, if I could really oversimplify it, it was about the state of art education in Singapore. And for me, you know, that is really how all-encompassing curatorial work can be because you are also concerned about um, the development of a future generation of artists. You're concerned about continuity. You're con concerned about um, what is the, immortal life, the, the, the immortality of a particular work of art and the continuation of ideas. Um, so I think I'll just kind of like leave it off there. I think kind of given an idea of the scope of work that you know, I, I engage in on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'll leave it for the conversation later. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, John. There we go, quite the maker in the exhibition making. Um, and you know, certainly, the, I think some of us, and we all do, we enjoy getting our hands dirty, even if after, immediately after, you go like, why? Oh, why? Did we do that because it sounded like a good idea at that time? And I think also part of what we do is that then when the audience walks in, everything looks flawless. Like you shouldn't have to think about anything because everything should look exactly where it meant to, which means you actually don't see the effort and the labor that went into 
you know, putting up the show. And to some degree, that's the irony of, I think, what exhibition makers do as well, which is you shouldn't actually see the making of it. You should just see the splendor, magnificent of the works and what the artists have done. And you don't think in some ways about the curator or the exhibition maker. Um, and Michelle, um, you two actually, speaking of pains and labors of the heart, <laughs> Michelle is going to take us through um, a current show which I think touches on some very interesting notions there, the managed heart. Art and emotional labor. Okay, but before I um, delve into this show, um, so I'm also um, considering what Chom and what John has shared. And indeed, when we think about, you know, ex ex exhibitions, when exhibition making occurs, we also need to think about the context, you know, of you know, what the show is about. Um, as Chom has shared, um, when there is a lack of infrastructure, you know, to run um, what to run the full ambitions of the show. There is um, these aspects of collaboration then come in, and as John had also shared, um, particularly from the perspective of an um, independent curatorial practice where you know, resources are, are limited, and then that's when um, a lot of um, initiative you know, comes about. So I do believe that you know, when we talk about exhibitions, the um, the type of show or the hosting institution or, you know, the commissioner, you know, these also come to determine what kind of exhibition is um, being produced. So right now I'm working in a university gallery at Nanyang Technological University, the School of Art, Design and Media. So even though we are open to the public, you know, um, the key ideas of, you know, why we, the shows we're doing, what is the purpose? Being in a university, um, it is uh, really centers down to research how art can connect to the humanities, how art can connect um, with <coughs> um, technology. And so that's what we do at the ADM gallery, trying to see how, um, trying to look at the gallery as a classroom as well to facilitate um, uh, teaching and learning for, for the students. Okay, so in this um, particular show, um, The Managed Heart, Art and Emotional <coughs> um, Labour, um, so it is um, precisely in an environment like um, the, a university that you know, we get to then look at these different strands or these kind of, um, the kind of topics that we want to um, touch on. Of course, through the lenses of um, art making. So in this show, we have um, seven artists, um, a lot of women artists in this um, show. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these works. Like, when you look at these works, you know, in a way, you can say, see that it's like a, a textbook exhibition, textbook, you know, curatorship, um, in that, you know, we are looking at artworks, uh, an exhibition that showcases a wide range of um, mediums, you know, from um, <coughs> objects um, to installations. But what I also want to highlight in this uh, as a curator, when we are working with artists, um, very often it's also following, you know, their work, their career, their projects that have not been seen. So very often when we are working in contemporary art, there is this um, and making exhibitions, you know, there is a, we, we privilege newness, we privilege making something new, what's the next new thing. Um, but in the process of also working with my artists and, you know, hearing, you know, ideas, you know, that have not been resolved or things that they want to work on, then for this show I realized that, you know, we have these couple of artists who had, you know, major presentations um, outside Singapore that did not have a chance to be seen in Singapore. So, for example, um, Stephanie J. Bird's um, Late Bloomer, um, the idea actually um, started, she made the work at the Bangkok um, Art um, Biennale in 2022. So, through, you know, dialogue with the artist to see how we can, instead of making something new, how can we expand the kind of um, thinking that germinated at an earlier stage and then we can also push um, the practice this way. So another um, artwork I want to highlight, um, artist is actually um, Angie Sia. Um, you know, Angie has shown in museums, she has shown in, in, in galleries, and also a lot of her, her practice also takes place through participatory um, projects with communities, working with senior citizens or working with young people. 
So very often, this kind of um, work is um, not as visible as you know, shows that we see in exhibitions in, in a white cube or in the museum. So um, I felt that you know, in exhibit in the, within the, you know, what curators can do, um, it is also important to kind of look back and highlight, you know, find a, a, you know, a, a way to visualize and document these um, efforts, these artistic efforts, which are, you know, also an equally important part of an artist's um, practice. So, next slide. Okay. Um, so, so far I've been talking about, you know, how a curator engages in exhibitions um, primarily through the kind of um, relationship with the artists, um, knowing about their practice, knowing what, how they want to expand, you know, in their art making. So, another show that um, happened earlier last year um, also had to make me think about exhibitions making in a different direction. And this show, um, Art After Warming, um, is um, of course looking at art and climate change, um, how artists uh, are making works to respond to um, the environment. So, um, on the top left-hand corner, you see the title wall of the exhibition, very um, bold graphics. So it is um, a contribution by a art collective called Dasat, um, and they work and they work towards this goal of a, a zero waste kind of um, practice in their art making. So all the vinyl stickers, vinyl stickers, you know, which is an essential material in exhibitions to put up text, to put up explanatory boards. So for the artist Dasat, um, all the graphics, you know, in the show were repurposed graphics, you know. So um, it's really a, a labor for them, you know, because so, so in the printing industry, you know, when we print, when we cut out posters, when we cut out text, what you see in C Focus, the alphabets, is the part of the sticker that's being used for the show. But the, the other discarded bits of stickers, all that goes to waste. So the artists, you know, they go to different printing shops and, you know, trying to explain their project and collecting these um, unwanted parts of um, stickers. Some of them have, you know, are quite, have quite large surface areas left. And then they try and they think of two levels. One, how to make art um, with this um, unwanted, um, waste material. And number two, how can this wasted material can also be part of the exhibition making, you know? So I think this um, shift to, so I mean, I was quite impressed by um, these efforts because there's a lot of explaining to shops that don't know um, what you're doing. In fact, it costs them more to run these odd-shaped leftover stickers through their printing machines. But this was a show that then make me, made me think, you know, from the role of a curator come exhibition maker, how, I, um, how the primary role is to support, you know, artworks and artists. You know, this show made me think, you know, how the, the role of a curator and an exhibition maker also might need to be a bit more self-aware, you know, of uh, resources, of materials. And, you know, when we make exhibitions, you know, I think we often think, okay, who is in this exhibition? Um, what can I add? You know, what works should we add? Um, so I think um, another way of, you know, thinking about exhibitions making in a more self-aware way is then to think about, you know, you know why am I adding? And, you know, what, what, what are we trying to say through these um, additions, through newness? Yeah, thank you. Sure, I love that, I love that. Maybe we should start thinking about what we can remove. I did an ex exhibition a while ago and I was like, why are we writing so many artwork captions? And, I, and, and so I did the first exhibition in my entire life that had no artwork captions at all. And I think the curatorial statement on the wall was like not more than 50 words long. So I think that's possible. This is a fun anecdote. Um, so much here that I think we can talk about, but certainly yeah, I think it's a trait that I've seen in um, audiences here in Singapore that the moment they walk into an exhibition space, they will read the label before they look at the artwork because I think it says very much about perhaps the way we're educated and raised, um, at least in this context, is that you always kind of want to know either the right answer, you don't want to feel dumb, so you do like the shortcut 
and you read the label before you um, actually see the artwork. Um, so I think that's kind of a nice move there. But amongst, I think, the many things that were maybe brought up here is I'm just thinking about perhaps the the diversity or the contrast in the context by which we operate. Like Chom, you're often working in situations where, you know, when you kind of talk about exhibition making, kind of say like, well, I don't really have that sad context. You kind of, as you said earlier, we just do it, you know, because it's like if you wait for the right, sometimes the venue or the right circumstances, you wait for funding, it's never going to happen. You know, you just kind of have people or things that kind of come together and then a little bit you make it up as you go along um, and then you also hope that also your audiences are able to, you know, make sense of it. I think that's a big part of the challenge of what you do. So I think also what's not really said explicitly is a big part of what exhibition making is, is actually just problem solving. Okay, part of this, I think we create the problems for ourselves. <laughs> So we only have ourselves to blame. Um, and then we go about trying to um, solve these you know, problems that kind of go along. And I think it might be actually useful sometimes for the audience is that when we think or talk through maybe issues or problems that we've encountered, then it helps people understand what it might be. So maybe along the line, and I'm also going to weave in another one which is related, um, it's also the issue of Ethics. Okay, big problem here, right? Um, but also, I think because for everyone here in the panel, we've also worked with different kinds of um, creative makers. Not everyone that you've worked with is a fine artist or an established artist. You might be working with an artisan, you might be working from someone who's definitely not in the fine art context, and you're bringing them into an environment for which they're work is being produced. So you're kind of a facilitator, but sometimes you are likely to encounter various kinds of issues of ethics. So um, I think along those two lines, and you can pick which one you want, is that if you wanted to maybe elaborate on in your practice or in your adventures or misadventures um, as a curator, has there been maybe one issue or problem that you encountered more recently that actually then helped you think around, okay, this is what I need to do here as an exhibition um, maker in order to have um, the show happen. Um, and then whether or not like ethics comes into it. So at least by way of a quick example, I know one for me happened years ago is when I was working with um, a Mongolian artist and you know he was bringing in materials from his home country and he was very very proud of it he's like this is my you know, my native heritage and all that and I'm like yeah I was so young then I, I didn't think much to ask about what these native materials might be um, until I found out when he arrived at the airport that they were endangered animal bones <laughs> And he spoke no English whatsoever. Um, so trying to then, at the moment, trying to convince some immigration and customs officer. Oh, and he also packed in some arrows because he wanted to show with the Singapore audience his, you know, um, his cultural heritage of shooting arrows. So I was trying to convince that um, customs and immigration that he was neither trading in illegal um, animal parts nor was he an arms dealer. Um, and because the exhibition had to go on, we had to find some creative ways. But there was certainly some questionable, I think, like I said, ethics around that. So um, along those two lines, I don't know if perhaps if... Um, yeah, a number of them. Are, you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the problem solving, and solving the problems that we sometimes create for ourselves. And then I'll share an anecdote about how the ethics, the ethical... Um, how the, the problem solving, the ethical ethical quandaries and, you know, like quandary, immigrations yeah. and, and etc. Um, so I have two really big pet peeves with respect to exhibition making in Singapore. And it is two very common refrains that you hear. Uh, one is 不可以, the other one is 差不多. Uh, 不可以 means 
cannot, or it, this can't be done. And the, the second one is, it looks about right. It's like almost there, you know, chaputo. And it annoys me to no end. Um, and, you know, visiting overseas institutions, um, the VNA um, in particular, you know, I was like, there's a whole balcony inside uh, a museum building, right? They managed to relocate a balcony into a museum. So why is something like suspending a light box uh, uh, cannot be done in Singapore. It's relatively straightforward. And so over the years, you know, I have really tried to build up my own technical proficiencies and you know, problem-solving capabilities in this respect. And you know, I, I go around in a, a van, which I now call the Exhibition Ambulance, because it's got just about every single type of glue, fastener, um, electric drill, tape, imaginable that something will get, some, it will always be hung, you know, regardless of, of the circumstance. But I, I, I do recognize that, you know, it might be also a larger problem in, in the ecosystem, you know, that supports the function of exhibition makers and curators as well, that um, ultimately, in terms of putting together an exhibition, you are pursuing something that is beyond Chaputo. That is, it's not, it's not about it just being just about right. You want to get it precise to a certain extent. You want to achieve a certain effect. You want to have a certain, you know, if you're doing a large scale scenography, you want to have a certain suspension of disbelief. And that requires um, a certain type of attitude that perhaps is not present in our ecosystem. It's not uh, present, but perhaps not apparent enough, not widespread enough in our ecosystem. Um, then, so, I think you know solving these kind of issues, right? It's a, it's more of a physical sort of problem-solving activity, uh, but then there's also the intellectual sort of problem-solving ability. And I think uh, Joyce, you might be familiar with our dear friend Ruang Sak, who left a whole bunch of uh, seven-month funeral ashes um, underneath my desk. Um, so we had a, a Thai artist um, nicknamed Cyanide Joe, who I worked with a number of years ago for the 2019 edition of the Singapore Biennale. And he was researching two trees that had been felled in Singapore, two extremely tall trees. And he wanted to use the soil um, gathered from around where those trees were felled um, to make a sculptural piece, a sculptural work of art. Um, so he was in Singapore, he collected some soil, and then he needed, you know, he needed to kind of bring it back to his workshop in Thailand. But obviously, for very obvious reason, you can't export soil Right, and so okay, what was the solution to this? You know, you know, it's not so much physical labor, but it's more like intellectual labor. At what point the soil ceased to be soil? And so I had to call up a, ceram a dear ceramicist friend of mine to fire all of that soil to above, uh, I think it was 1,200 degrees Celsius, because at that point it's not soil anymore; it's clay, it's ceramics, and then had it all beaten up and ground down to a powder, a dust again. Uh, and therefore bypassing this problem. Is it unethical? I'm not sure. I feel like we're kind of like skirting that. But right after I solved that problem for him, he found uh, even more exciting material because uh, it was seven months in Singapore. It was the Hungry Ghost Festival. Um, and there were a lot of these burnt offerings. Uh, and he decided to collect a big tub of it. Um, and he brought it by the museum office uh, I was not in office at that point of time, and so he told one of the project managers, oh, like, uh, John figured out how to get the soil, right? So John will figure out how to get it to me. And so for approximately two months, I had a um, big box of burnt seven-month offering sitting under my desk, which I think Joyce actually was kind enough to resolve for me by calling a, a medium a to shaman. dispose of it, a shaman. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, I guess the questionable ethics about it because is that this was seven month offerings. You couldn't just chuck it out. I mean, whether or not you believed in it, I mean, certainly we had colleagues who believed it, it would be disrespectful. Yeah, very so, improper. Um, so, John had that material there, and then um, we actually did have a spiritual cleaner, a shaman that would periodically come around the museum because this is contemporary art in Southeast Asia. Right, this is what needs to be taken care of. Uh, and then, so I brought him around. I'm like, 
can you help us sort he's like he's like okay i need to kind of do a little bit of cleansing here and then we can um dispose of it but these are i think some of the unusual but real situations that we do encounter um i guess creating exhibitions or projects in southeast asia where it's the art intersecting with nature intersecting with the spiritual um and then again all of that unknown charm you wanted to say something. I, I just i just want to say that's awesome story um <laughs> What I wanted to say was, I just want, because you're on that energy spiritual thing, the thing with my approach, which has been just to do it, when you do it for long enough, it becomes a practice. Someone reminded me of this. Like 12, 15 years in, your approach, as chaotic as it is, actually has a through line. And the challenge of accepting that means responsibility. So if your responsibility is to create space and relationships, that's kind of what my practice has evolved to be, but the challenge of that is like actually taking the time to understand other people's ethics, where they come from, how they, how they can cohabit space. So sometimes what I do before Apinan gave me a title of curator was considered para-curatorial, which is so bizarre because we're in a room together. You know, we're always in a room together. When you go and experience art, you're not often alone. So the idea of bringing people together to converge in a room, that's about relationships. That is actually, it's relational. I mean, that practice. I love that John focuses so much on the documentation and the talks because that's the other aspect. I'm really curious how what you do, and for example, the relational thing that I do can can merge more often, whereby you bring, like, I guess, it's like intelligence in the room when you put someone together next to someone, you know they're gonna get along and something might happen. But that, I think, has been, in a way, a challenge for me over the last 10, 12 years, but also something so specific to Southeast Asia, because a girlfriend of mine from the Philippines said, the thing with the art world in Southeast Asia is we just like to hang out together. So that is really important, and I think, you know, it goes back to ethics because, you know, what's, we have a share, we, we eat family style, right? So this sharing, this communal, this, you know, transcendence into like energy, you know, no one thinks twice when you're like, let's, for us, let's call a shaman to move the clouds away. No one in Southeast Asia says you're crazy because we accept it as truth. And I think the challenge of sometimes exhibition making that turns into events because the pace at which we go to all of these things, how do we give it depth? How do we retain its complexity despite its form being very simple, like having drinks together in a bar, you know? So I think this is something like, I think this panel, I, I, I want to I wanna kind of delve into more, but I think that where we are, because we're always in motion and doing in Thailand, you know, I know that my colleagues and my friends love having John in Thailand because you give this critical discourse to what we do, but actually in a way which is also simplified and, and yet very complex and accessible. So I guess that's, yeah, what I want to say. And Michelle, I don't know if you had something to throw for us by way of happy problems that we encounter. I think when Joyce, you brought up this um, context of ethics of curating, you know, um, I think for me, I would break, I, I kind of break it down to, you know, okay, what is responsible curating, right? So, which was why I, mean, I was thinking about it since we first started, you know, um, when, when this panel was convened and we we're talking earlier. So, which was why I brought up the art after warming show when I start to begin to think about responsible cur curatorship, you know, to space, to materials, to, to the environment. But also another form of responsible curating I would then, would be then, after the show is over, you know, what is left to do, what is left to take care of, you know. So very often, you know, especially, let's say, in certain, you know, context of certain spaces, exhibitions come and go, you know, they're so fast. Um, works are commissioned, you know, where do they go? So I think one way of, you know, how, you know, curators can also, 
you know, act responsibly even after a project is delivered is to, you know, follow up with the artist to, you know, see if there, are, there is interest, you know, in these newly made works, you know, can they travel, where else can they circulate to? And I think that really ties up very well a thread just running through, which is, um, I think what everyone here does as an exhibition maker and dance curator, it's actually there is a tremendous duty of care. Um, there's a lot of responsibility in what we do, not just actually to the audiences, but also to the makers of the work, um, the, the creators, the artisans. And then I think therefore as an exhibition maker, you are holding it all together and in a way making sense of what may not always have so much sense to start with. Um, but like I said, if all goes well, um, I think for the audience is that oftentimes you're coming here having a great experience and if it goes really well that when you leave you have a little something to think about more than when you first entered the show. So with that, please join me to thank our panellists um, and also for C Focus for hosting this wonderful conversation and after this, please go out and enjoy the rest of the exhibition. Thank you.